Hi, my name is Keetra Olson, and I am the Wisconsin Foods Program Director at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. Um, I work on a team that is charged with helping to market and grow uh, Wisconsin agricultural products. Um, and we do this through a couple of different ways. We have several different teams. Um, we have a team that works mostly with farms. Um, we have a team that actually does international work and helps to um, export products. And then we have um, the team that I work on, which uh, really, really focuses on um, helping to market products uh, within the state. Um, we do um, food business development as well as uh, producer development. Um, in my role, I'm able to help with uh, some business planning, um, market planning, uh, finding markets, uh, marketing, things like that. Um, so I, I guess the first thing I'd like to do is, is go through this PowerPoint. A colleague of mine uh, actually manages this program. It's called the Something Special from Wisconsin program. Um, so if we want to go ahead and click through to the next slide, um, it's uh, a program that's um, been around since 1983. And actually on the next slide, there's a little bit more about that. Um, the program started in 1983. It's in the state statutes. Um, the whole idea behind the program is to uh, have uh, a sort of a collective program to help market the Wisconsin agricultural products that we produce here in the state. Um, moving on to the next slide, you can see there are um, several different products that we're able to um, market through this program. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, Part of the way that we use this program to do any marketing is um, through the use of the logo, which you can see on almost every single slide uh, in, the, in the presentation. It's yellow and red. It says something special from Wisconsin. And essentially, when a company joins the program uh, and becomes a member, they're then entitled to use uh, this logo sort of anywhere. They can use it on their packaging. Um, they can use it on their promotional materials. They can also use it on their website. Um, and there's a, a nice photo of an example of um, how Mauer Farm has decided to use it. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, as I said, once you join the program and become a member, um, you're able to use this logo. The membership fees, um, we're set in 1983, which is sort of benefits us because they have not uh, changed since 1983. So the most um, anyone ever has to pay to be a member is about $200. And I believe that that is the fee if you are grossing $500,000 in sales a year. Um, so most companies do, do not uh, oh, that much on their annual membership fee. The next slide actually has that breakdown. Um, the membership year runs uh, along with our fiscal year at the state, which is July 1st through June 30th, which is a little complicated for folks to keep track of, but Lois um, does a really great job of reminding people to renew their memberships. The next slide, uh, has just a little example of um, some of the different types of members we have. We have processors and manufacturers, uh, you know, in the food sector. We have farms that are direct marketing. We have different distributors. Um, we have entrepreneurs. And I, again, I, you know, it, it's meant for agricultural products, but you know, that's not just. Um, you know, fresh, fresh turkey and meat and produce and things like that. We also have um, a company that makes different sort of Wisconsin-themed items, uh, handkerchiefs, uh, puzzles, things like that. Um, we have several companies that are um, sort of body care, you know, soaps and lotions and things like that. Um, and then also different associations, as you'll see on the, the next slide. Um, the Wisconsin Aquaculture Association is a member. Uh, the Wisconsin um, uh, Grape Growers Association, uh, wineries, I think um, Bed and Breakfast Association of Wisconsin is a member. 
Um, so we have quite a, quite a range. On the next slide, too, is another example of even um, more members that we have that are cooperatives. So on this slide, we have uh, some examples of the different um, organizations that Something Special from Wisconsin uh, partners with and um, different uh, channels that um, I know Lois uses to um, share success stories about not just the program, but also the companies and organizations that join the program. On the next slide is a really great example of one of the partnerships that Lois has established over the past few years uh, with Discover Wisconsin. Uh, it's a, a, a blog called The Bobber um, that always features Wisconsin, or, uh, that always features something special from Wisconsin businesses. On the next slide, again, Wisconsin Foodie is another um, uh, organization um, that Lois partners with. It's actually a really great um, TV show on PBS that features all uh, Wisconsin farmers, uh, restaurants, and processors. The next slide is Alice in Dairyland, which is um, someone who um, is actually on staff here at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. Um, Alice changes every year. It's a new Alice. Um, and each year, Lois partners with uh, the Alice in Dairyland program to um, host a, a holiday sort of um, promotion. So members of Something Special send their products in to um, the Alice in Dairyland program, and then Alice basically tours around the state and promotes the products that were sent in by the members, which is very, very cool. On the next slide is another example of a partnership that Lois has um, worked with over the past few years. She sort of negotiates a really great deal for booth space at the Midwest um, at the Midwest Food Service Expo, which is uh, held every year in Milwaukee. Um, I think she typically has about 30 companies that come and exhibit there, and it's a really great way to get your name out, especially if you're interested in starting to sell to uh, institutions or restaurants. The next slide, yes, media definitely loves, loves the Something Special from Wisconsin program, um, and so many of the members that are part of the program um, also have great relationships with the media, so that's very common. Um, on the next slide, uh, the Wisconsin Grocers Association, again, just another partner, um, same moving, moving to the, to the second, second to last slide, um, Lois often partners with them when they have their, um, their restaurant show. So again, um, she sort of negotiates uh, reduced booth prices. Um, significantly, actually. Um, they're really great deals, so uh, just, just another venue to help get um, members' uh, names out there. Um, the next slide just has a little bit of information on, on where to find more information. The website is listed if, if you know, anyone would like to join. Um, Lois also has a Facebook and a Twitter account. Um, and the next slide has uh, Lois's contact information. So never hesitate to, to reach out and talk with her. In terms of other uh, assistance that we have here at the department, um, I had mentioned earlier we have a, a group that sort of just works with farmers. Um, again, any, anyone can go ahead and call the Farm Center. There is a hotline number, actually. Um, and we have folks in the Farm Center who can help with uh, transition planning. So if, if uh, there's a farm or um, an agricultural, you know, sort of organization that needs help with transitioning, the Farm Center can help with that. They're also really helpful with financials um, and doing some financial analysis. Um, we also have different areas of um, expertise, we have someone who works just in the meat and livestock industry, the dairy industry, if you can believe it, in Wisconsin, we have a specialist for that. Um, we also have someone that does farm to school work on our team. Uh, and myself, I, I'm the local food specialist. Um, 
And through the program that I direct, the Wisconsin Foods Program, there's also uh, some funding opportunities. Um, <clears throat> there's a grant program called the Buy Local, Buy Wisconsin grants that have been around since about 2008. Um, and grants are awarded to folks uh, who have projects that are um, gosh, just really um, trying to reduce any barriers or hurdles that local local producers or processors face to getting their product um, uh, to their local market. So I'm always more than happy to discuss that with folks. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about anything that I mentioned with this. Um, Lois can, of course, answer your questions about something special from Wisconsin. Uh, any of your other questions can be directed to me. I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Alice Barron, and I'm the Executive Director of Certified Naturally Grown. I will be uh, sharing with you some basic information about our certification program for aquaponics producers and the organization itself. Um, first, a, a bit about me. Um, I am, I've been with Certified Naturally Grown since 2006. Uh, our office is based in New York. Um, I'm not a farmer myself. I um, became director uh, of CNG when the farmers who started the organization wanted to continue focusing on farming and um, have someone else run the organization, which um, started back in 2002. I'll tell you a bit about that in a second. But I, I grow mushrooms and uh, have cut beads um, in the past and worked with our advisory council of aquaponics experts, including Rebecca Nelson and John Pay, um, to develop our aquaponics certification program, which we launched in 2016. Um, this is me visiting some of our members in Kentucky. Um, outside of Lexington, Bluegrass Aquaponics, and, and their system is a Nelson and Pace system, in fact. Um, so, a little bit about Certified Naturally Grown. Um, we were founded by farmers back in 2002 who were very committed to organic practices. We're mostly selling locally um, and uh, found themselves faced with a decision um, about whether to go through the then new organic certification process or stop using the word organic to describe their produce. Um, they didn't feel the USDA organic program was a good fit for them given the scale of their operation. They knew many of their customers and um, so they created this alternative as a way to convey their commitment to growing food without synthetic chemicals or GMOs um, without um, having to go through that, that process that felt a bit too onerous for them. Um, so today we're an independent nonprofit organization. There's more than 750 farmers and beekeepers participating throughout North America. Um, we uh, have members in 47 states and U.S. territories as well as six Canadian provinces. Um, CND, a lot of folks want to know first off the bat, well, how is it different from organic? What are, what, you know, what are the similarities and differences? So, just like organic farmers, the similarities are that CNG farmers don't use synthetic chemicals, GMOs. Um, they rely on cover crops um, to improve their soil and manage weeds. There are no synthetic, no growth hormones in livestock. And um, for the land-based livestock, organically grown feed is required. Now, with aquaponics, it's a little different because there's almost no certified organic fish feed available on the market. So. We, um, we did develop a certification program for the aquaponics producers, um, and we do not, um, we'll, we'll certify the produce um, of those operations, but we don't currently offer certification for the fish in those aquaponics operations because of the, the lack of feed that would meet the standards. Um, but going back to the difference between uh, CNG and organic, also, like the organic program, Certified Naturally Grown has a set of transparent standards that all our producers must, must meet in order to qualify to be Certified Naturally Grown. Those are all on our website, and I'll give you the, the, the link to the aquaponics standards shortly. Um, just like organic farms, there's an application that producers fill out in order to begin the certification process. They need to describe their production practices, how they manage uh, pests and disease, 
um, and those answers become part of the public record of that producer once they're certified naturally grown. There's also an annual on-site inspection carried out typically by another certified naturally grown producer in the area, but we have a few alternatives for folks who live in remote areas or for whom um, that's just not an option. So the main difference, of course, if folks want to know, well, how are you different from organic? Um, the main difference is that CMD is tailored for local farmers. Um, we're focused on producers growing food for their local community, and our certification model is different. We rely on peer reviews. Um, it's usually another producer who comes out. Um, it costs less to be certified organic, typically than the USDA organic certification. It costs many hundreds of dollars if not thousands of dollars. Um, and with Certified Naturally Grown, we recommend 200 and the base cost is 150 um, There's also less paperwork in the certification process for CNG. Typically, our members are selling at farmer's markets through food co-ops and independent grocers, sometimes restaurants and their own on-site farm stands, as well as community-supported agriculture programs, or CSAs. This is one of our farming uh, members in Texas, uh, Moondog Farm. Um, and then a little bit more on the certification model that we rely on. It's, it's a little less familiar to folks here in North America, but has been widely embraced in uh, Southeast Asia, especially as well as South America, by organizations and governments that are seeking to build the organic movement and include small-scale producers in it while verifying production practices meet organic standards. Um, the key features of our model called a participatory guarantee system is that it relies on those peer review inspections. The participants are actively engaged in the verification process. It's tailored for local small-scale producers. It's a high degree of transparency. All of our members' certification documents are available on their CND profile on our website. Um, and the organization that's uh, most vocally promoting PGS internationally is iPhone Organics International. You can learn more about this movement at iPhone.cio slash PGS. So I'm going to go a little bit into the process of getting CND certified and then some of the benefits. Um, and another project that we're working on to enhance those benefits. So the first step is to review the standards. For aquaponics, you'll want to go to cmgfarming.org slash aquaponics. There you'll get frequently asked questions and uh, a link to our standards for aquaponics producers. You know, review them. If they're, if they're not clear, get in touch with us. I'll give you my contact info at the end. Make sure they're a good fit for your operation or that you could make adjustments to be comfortably within those standards. Um, and uh, we think for many aquaponics producers, it's not a big adjustment to meet the CNG standards um, and that it's well worth doing. Um, if it does feel like a good fit, then the first step is to apply online, and you would do that at uh, cngfarming.org. Um, our website is at the at the end, cndfarming.org. Um, and then once your application is accepted, there are three core requirements that you would need to, to meet to complete the process. There's a one-page declaration that you would sign and return to us. Uh, membership dues, of course, to keep the program running. We uh, rely primarily on certification dues for our operation costs. We recommend 200. Um, but the minimum is 150 per year. And then you'd arrange your on-site inspection to be carried out by another CNG producer near you. Ideally, it's another aquaponics producer or instructor, or uh, a hydroponics producer is also an option. Um, we will help you identify someone if you're having difficulty, and as a fallback, you can rely on a CNG soil-based farmer or a certified organic farmer in your area. Um, but it is it, that is sometimes a challenge, and we do our best to connect our prospective members with producers to do that on-site inspection. And lastly, there's a work requirement. Everyone who participates in CNG agrees to conduct an inspection of another CNG producer near them if there is someone within an hour's drive of a similar production type. 
So we would want beekeepers inspecting beekeepers as we see here and aquaponics producers inspecting other aquaponics producers. Um, the purpose is not only to verify standards are being met, but also to connect with one another, learn from each other, develop those networks that can help um, help uh, farmers and producers succeed when you have someone to call on for advice or tips or if you want to go in on ordering supplies together, you can save money and um, enhance your chance of success as a business. Um, so everyone who is CND certified is listed on our website at cndfarming.org. You can easily find a producer near you. We have a searchable map. Um, the first page you'll get to is this list of all the states where we have producers. If you want to click on the state name, you can find all producers in that state, or you can enter your zip code on the right-hand side or the name of your town and state and do a search by radius. So here's an example of what you'll find if you look at all CNG farms in Wisconsin. Um, the colored dots indicate the type of certification. Um, the blue dots indicate the aquaponics producer, and we're producers, and we're happy to see there's a three in Wisconsin, not too surprisingly, perhaps, with Nelson and Paige being right there. Um, the yellow is, uh, is uh, beekeepers, red is livestock, and the rest, the green ones are for produce certification. And here I've done a, a presented a map of um, all producers within 100 miles of Dallas, Texas. This is where I searched by radius. Um, using that the image under the map on the right side of that page. Um, and this will cross state lines if necessary. Dallas and, of course, Texas is a big state, but this allows you to hone in on a more specific region. And then below the map, for both of these types of maps, you'll see a listing of all the farms that are indicated on the map. So here we've got two aquaponics producers outside in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and one produce farmer. And then if you click on the name um, of one of these CNG farmers, the CFW Aquaponics Farms, if you click on that, you'll get their profile. Here's an example of another farm's profile, Moondog Farms in Texas. Um, you'll see they grow the types of produce we don't often, we, <laughs> we can't grow here in New York or in Wisconsin. Um, but the member, each profile has their contact info, the farm location on the map is indicated. Um, a little button that's not conveyed here, but a, a, where folks can click an email button to send a message to that farmer, and the farmer's email address is kept private. Um, they can also click a link to the application that was submitted, an image of their signed declaration, that one-page form that they return annually, and also review their inspection report. Farmers can upload images. Um, they can put, as they have done, put photos on here of anything they want. And that descriptive text um, under their farm name is what they added themselves. Um, so the benefit of these, um, these profiles is that it helps our members connect with one another, and it definitely helps customers find CND producers near them. They can contact them directly, either by email or you'll see up at the top, their social media accounts can easily be accessed by clicking on the Instagram or Facebook image. So that was, was, the map is one of the benefits of certification. Um, you have an instant online presence um, for, for many beginning farmers. That's helpful um, to already be visible and available to prospective customers and have that credential right there. Um, in addition, uh, our members can get access to the more selective co-ops and farmers markets that are looking for their suppliers to have certification. They'll also have a listing on the CNG website, as I just mentioned, and authorization to use our logo and marketing materials on their produce or packaging. Um, here's an example of a sign that we make available to our members that can be posted at the farm stand. Um, at the farmer's market in your, if you have an on-site store. Also, to bundle your greens, we have these colorful twist ties that our members really like. They come in 12-inch and 18-inch lengths in bundles of one, uh, 500. And we also have stickers in various sizes that can be put directly on the produce itself. And lastly, our, our members do get a certificate once they complete the certification process. 
um, we made those available in full color and laminated. If folks want to use it as a sign, we have other types of signs that are available to our members with the farm name on it that says proud to be. So lots of marketing materials. What we're working on now, this is a new project that we're building out called the Guide to Exceptional Markets, where we are listing those farmers markets and independent grocers that recognize, prefer, or require that their vendors have CNV certification or typically also organic certification is another option. Um, this is something that we noticed happening many years ago um, where farmers markets that had more vendors than they could accept were filtering out the best by requiring that they hold CND certification or organic certification. And that uh, enables the market manager to quality produce to their customers and helps them sift through the applications that they have coming in. Um, it's, we have that Guide to Exceptional Markets on our website, cngfarming.org slash gem. Um, and if you uh, think that your market should be listed or your local food co-op should be listed, there's a easy to find button there where you can make that recommendation to us. We'd be eager to connect with them and see if they qualify to be listed. Um, a couple examples here. Food Conspiracy Co-op in Tucson, Arizona was one of the first to be listed. They have, um, obviously are buying a lot of organic produce as we see the pineapples and bananas there, but they're also very proactively reaching out to local farmers. Those are the farmers who picked it up above. You'll see in those nice portraits and many of those are certified naturally grown farmers. Here is Ozark Natural Foods in Little Rock. Arkansas, it's actually not in Little Rock, I'm sorry, that's a mistake, it's in Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, has a similar policy. So there are a lot of CNG farmers in that, in Northwest Arkansas, supplying Ozark Natural Foods co op um, So, you know, the benefits to being a part of CNG for many of our members go well beyond the marketing benefits. They really are drawn to CNG and stick with us because they appreciate the opportunity to connect with networks of like-minded farmers they want to learn from their peers and their experiences. There's such a, it's such a knowledge intensive and isolating occupation that the on-site peer review inspection is a really rare and valuable opportunity to connect with someone else who deals with a lot of the same struggles and has knowledge that can be very valuable um, when you connect with them. And a lot of our members really want to convey their commitment to producing food for their local community without any synthetic chemicals or GMOs. And having this seal, the, the verification of being certified naturally grown makes that commitment visible and helps build awareness about the importance of sustainable food production. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if you want to follow up with me by phone or email, I have my contact info here. Um, Alice Varen at naturallygrown.org. You can reach us and uh, by phone most days of the week, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So um, here, here I am at Bluegrass Aquaponics outside Lexington, Kentucky, and happy to connect with you guys in the future if you have any questions. Thanks. All right, good afternoon or good morning, depending on, I guess, where you guys are. Um, my name is Jackie Zimmerman, and I work with the Fish Feed Company, and the company is spreading. Uh, we are based in Willow, Utah, which is just outside of Salt Lake City. Our three locations in North America. I happen to be at the location that is in the United States. We have two others, one on the east and west coast of Canada. So Emma and the team have asked me to talk about fish food, and there's nothing more really that I like to talk about nutrition, so I guess that's really because my past has been a lot of a lot of schooling for nutrition, and um, and ultimately the, the learning that I did, I tried to take it to the commercial sector of aquaculture, and I managed commercial facilities in Hawaii for about nine years before. Spreading has asked me to come on board, and I've been with Spreading now 
um, almost seven years. It'll be February. It'll be seven years. So my position there right now is a sales manager for the U.S. And what that means is just about everything. Um, you're a fish farmer. I'm a fish farmer. It means we do just about everything. Everybody says when I talk, I am selling seeds. But um, ultimately, my real purpose is to give you, the farmer, a very basic, good understanding of nutrition. And then the most important component is really to understand the farm, the species that you're growing, and try to make you successful from suggesting ways to improve your conversion, or maybe even improve things on your farm. So I do a lot of farm visits, and I do a lot of these seed workshops. So your feedback to Emma, and please be brutally honest, is very helpful for me. As I understand, this is a pretty diverse group of people, so we'll start with some basics, and we'll go through a few slides. I've thrown in a couple of complicated um, graphs, but for the most part, I'll try to keep it very basic and simple. And ultimately, if I don't cover what you would have liked to hear, hear or have questions, Emma will have all my contact information as I'm not right there with you. So feel free to reach out. But we're going to get an overview to start with the presentation. And this is the fish feed basics. We're going to go through how fish feed is made, the ingredients and feed formulations, common feed questions that I get usually when I'm at farms or doing these kinds of presentations, and very much on feed management. And that's very specific to every farm. So it's hard to come in and say over the intercom video, or even when I'm on site sometimes, until I get a very good feel of the farm, what are the ways to improve? And that might be a combination of many things related to feed management. We'll touch on just a few of those. So we'll start at the beginning, and that was, how was fish feed made? And this is a picture of a long time ago, but really not so long ago. I think this was taken in the 50s. This is the old way. These are parts and pieces of, I believe it is a horse. And, you know, for the most part, fish food was grinding up parts and pieces of other things, of other, other animals, and feeding it to the fish. And I can guarantee you if I would have thought that that would have been me, I would not have chosen this as a career. So thank goodness that it looks more like this. Um, the new way of feed formulation where you have a pellet. But to get from that pellet, to what makes it and what's the process. This is a brief overview of a fish feed plant. And I don't have a pointer to show, show you, but we're going to start from the left and go all the way to the right, starting where we see the oil tanking. Oil tanks or any other raw materials that are received in our plant go through screening. And then they are stored in a raw material silo. That raw material silo, whenever we're ready to make a feed formulation, that feed formulation picks what we need. And then those raw materials, if needs be, they go through an additional grinding process. Um, there will be premixes and pigment if you're using astaxanthin in your diet added. And then it goes through the extruder. And I'll show you some pictures of this, real live pictures, but this is the schematic. Once it goes through that extruder, the real important part is that it gets dried. And so we have a series of dryers that the feed goes through. And then from there, it actually has to be cooled. So from the cooler, where we have created a few maybe smaller parts and pieces, not the exact pellet, we're going to sieve off all of that debris, any kind of dust. And then if we needed to top coat it with anything else, like additional oil, or in the case of medicated seed, we have a top coater at the very end. It would go through the sieve one more time, and then it's into the bag. That could be a bulk bag. It could be 40 pounds. It could be 2,000-pound bag. Or it could be just directly loaded into a truck. Just to give you a little overview of what the plant in Tuella looks like, um, it's a feed, feed mill, and there's snow. <laughs> So we deal a lot with the cooling and the heating of the outside temperatures and inside temperatures. That's why that cooling and um, drying process is so essential in our environment. We receive, as I said, those raw materials, those silos that I mentioned to you. Here's just a picture of how big they are. There are approximately 20 silos that we hold 
various different types of raw materials into. That truck there on the far right, uh, left hand side is actually unloading from the bottom and that raw material is going underneath the cement where you're looking and into those seed storage bins. So a pretty elaborate process in order to get the raw material started. Here's an example of a fish seed extruder. And from the picture, I know it's not so extravagant. But basically, it's a pressure cooker, <laughs> I guess lack of better words. The raw materials are then batched out, as we talked about, and put through the extruder under steam and pressure. And just out of the other end is what's going to come your feed. A lot of people ask, how do you make the different pellet sizes? And if you look here, this picture is a picture of all the different, what we refer to as the dye sizes. So that dye gets changed out each time we're making a different pellet. You can see there are blades that would break across that opening and create your pellet size. So lots of questions regarding that pellet size. We can address some of those in the frequently asked questions. But basically, um, then again, the food is bagged up, ready to go. And this is just an example of where the truck is being weighed out and it's on its way. Very brief overview of what is an extremely um, elaborate process. I think um, it's always beneficial for someone if you ever have an opportunity to visit a seed plant. We do accept visitors and I'm happy to host anybody out there in our Tulilla plant. It really gives people a much, much better understanding of what goes into this process. So if you're the engineer side of things, you just saw the engineering, I guess you could say, part of the, the, the actual physical process of making the feed. Now the ingredients in the feed formulation is really where, for example, my background comes from and where we talk about exactly what ingredients need to go for each fish species and how do we get a feed formulation. So we're going to talk about a lot of things today, but as any presenter says, you know, most of it's going to go in one out ear and out the other. Hopefully you retain some of it in the middle. This is one of the slides that I hope you retained in the middle. I'll point out what I think are my key points. This is one takeaway message that's pretty important. Just from the very beginning of a nutrient requirement for fish. Fish have really no requirement for any one particular ingredient. What they do have is a requirement for dietary energy and a number of essential nutrients, amino acids, et cetera, et cetera. So when someone says, well, this fish you must eat fish food and it can't have anything else. The reality is there are species that are not able to process maybe some raw materials, but let's just use, for example, rainbow trout, where they have the ability to process many different raw materials. It doesn't make any sense to say, well, they can't have a fish feed that contains poultry meal instead of fish meal. So that's what we really are talking about when we talk about no requirement for any particular feed ingredient, it's that building blocks of the essential uh, amino acids and nutrients that we're looking for to help formulate the feed. And the art of feed formulation is really to meet the nutrient requirements for that species for maximum fish performance, but we really do also have to do that at a reasonable cost because there's lots of raw materials that are on the market at very small volumes and very high prices, but we have to have a fish feed that can be affordable. So that's really a pretty important component of how we take a look at feed formulation. What you see here is the brown pellet on the left side, and what makes up that brown pellet is really very interesting. Um, this, is, this, this is the backbone of really feed formulation. And if you look at the bottom and going towards the top, we've used the portion of the pellet that takes up the most of what's typically in a feed, and that is the protein. Most feed that is produced contains anywhere between 30, 32, maybe up to 50, 53 percent. It just varies very much so regarding the species that we're talking about. But that protein source can be fish meal, poultry meal, feather meal, 
blood meal, other vegetable proteins. However, again, I will stress, it does depend on the species. So the next portion of the pellet, what makes the next biggest portion? That's the oil, or as I always refer to it as the energy in the diet. And so energy in the diet ranges from as low as 12%, some of the diets I've seen, um, for some just basic maintenance diet, but can go really as high as 38%. There are a lot of salmon diets that are out there that have very, very high oil percentages, and we'll get into the reasons behind that. But fish oil is very popular, obviously. Um, poultry oil and vegetable oil are what make up a part of this portion. And then the fiber and carbohydrates, a very small component of, you know, less than 15% of the diet. But those are really essential, and we'll get into each one of these a little bit more in more detail. Ash and moisture, and then take a look at the one, less than 1% is your vitamins and minerals. And as I mentioned before, if you're using any type of pigment. How do we make sure we are getting the quality raw materials that I just talked about? Well, I think that probably if you're a chef, if you're a baker, or if you cook, this is not really much different. Um, it is all about the quality of what you start with. And so the ingredients are purchased for the basis of what we refer to making up this feed as raw materials. And all of those components that make up the feed raw materials, it's very important that you understand how those raw materials are evaluated, to what precision are the evaluations being measured of those raw materials, and are the key elements in the formulation being um, evaluated, such as those things that we just mentioned. And is the feed formulated to the real nutritional profile of the ingredients that are received? So that's a lot of questions. What does all that mean? Really what it means is when you start with quality and you end with quality, you get quality. So it is definitely not always cheap feed. To be honest with you, which can be the best feed. And that's part of the feed management that we're going to discuss. But before moving forward on anything, I think it's very important from any feed producer that you are getting your feed from that you start to learn a little bit and ask some questions about their quality control and about how the raw materials are evaluated before we ever start to make the fish food. Now if we have all these raw materials, how do we measure them? How do we answer the questions that I just brought up? And nutrition is really about the digestible nutrients in the raw material. The higher the quality of the raw material, the higher the digestible nutrients are. And that's a real key component when we talk about determining what is something that the fish can utilize as a digestible nutrient or a digestible portion of the nutrient versus what might go out the other end, right, which we really don't want to pay that much for. So raw materials is important because we need to know what their composition is. If I receive fish meal, if we're receiving fish meal, we need to know exactly how the percentage of protein and the percentage of fat is in that particular raw material coming in. We need to understand the digestibility of those raw materials because that is the basis of formulating. And we do that by using a series of um, tests, and one of those tests that we get a chance to use is an NIR, a near infrared system, in which we have instantaneous results on just what I was talking about, the digestible energy in the diet, how much protein is in the diet, how much fat, how much protein and fat is in the raw material, not the finished product. But we do actually get a chance to test the finished product using that same technology. So basically, when we talk about all of these things, we're looking at the raw materials, we need to understand the fish itself, what are the digestible nutrient requirements for that fish, are there any anti-nutritional factors that are very important that we should pay attention to? And then when we look at the feed, it needs to be optimized formulation. We need to talk about the fish size. Is it a small fry, small larvae? However, you um, refer to your fish. Is it just from high up stage? If we're talking about some trout, where is it in the growth cycle of its life? Because we need to feed fish differently based on where they are during their life cycle. So it also includes a lot of things on the farm, obviously. 
your environment, um, temperature VOs, disease, what types of lighting do you have on your um, in your area? Seasonality is a very important component. Um, so environment absolutely plays a key role in what we would call the overall finished product of feed. So I gave you one message to start with and said this is your first take home message and this is the slide that is the second take home message. And I think I just said digestible, digestible like 50 times, right? So what does that mean, Jackie? Like what does that exactly mean from someone who maybe, you know, is, is not in this nutrition world every day and has all this slang that we talk about. So the easiest way to describe it is we'll use protein as an example. And the crude value of that particular raw material, we, we're talking about protein, versus the digestible amount of protein. So the crude protein is what you're going to see on your feed label. And we're going to get to that later. That means that is the crude amount, the total valued amount of protein that is in that particular diet. That is by the FDA required that it goes on the label. If you go a little step further though, we want to know the digestible protein. That is the portion of the crude protein that is actually going to be used by the fish. And as I said, the higher the quality of your raw material, you're going to get a higher ratio of what is digestible compared to what is not. So if you're looking at that pellet and we're just talking about protein, you can see that you want to have a higher level of digestible protein versus that non-digestible protein. So when we talk now moving forward, I'm going to continue to use the word digestible protein. Now we've got the definition. That's why I think this is a pretty important slide. Digestible protein is what the fish is actually going to use in order to grow make new sales, um, do everything that's necessary for optimal performance. So if we take a look at the types of proteins, and I just went a little too fast, sorry, I'll go back. Types of proteins. Now we're going to break down each one of these segments and then ask ourselves what is the raw material that is in those. And you saw that we've got them listed here, um, but it's important to kind of really take a look and examine your feed label to understand what type of protein is in the feed itself. We could have, as I've mentioned already, I think the only one I didn't mention was uh, corn gluten meal. Again, the largest part of what we're looking at. So this is just to give you an example of what fish meal looks like when it's received in the plant. Now if we take a look at the oil or fat and lipids, all kind of the same thing. Uh, we talked about the general ranges of what those percentages could be, and it's interesting to take a look at the sources of those, fish oil, poultry oil, um, vegetable oil. This is probably one of the biggest components of research that's going on right now in aquaculture all over the world, not only in fish meal, which I didn't mention, but fish oil is a very limited resource, and so we can't just formulate using the best of the best of the best, I guess you could say, all the time because it's just not always going to be there. And that's why nutrition and the research, for example, that feed companies do and feed companies all over the world, we're really trying to find alternatives to some of these limiting resources. Fish oil happens to be one of the most limiting resources that we talk about. And so therefore, it's very important to make sure that when we are using a specific type of oil, that we want to get the maximum energy um, and the maximum use out of that oil in your diet. Oil is the most efficient source of energy for almost every species. Um, as dietary energy content level increases, so if you have a higher oil content, your fish will typically grow faster and have a lower feed conversion ratio. We're going to review that statement a little bit later and take it apart a little bit because it clearly that actually does apply for most species, but everybody grows fish for a different reason. So the guy that's growing the fish in the backyard for the ponds for their families to come and take a look at and and maybe fish every once in a while is a very different type of feed that we may suggest 
compared to a commercial trout farmer who's really trying to get a pound and a half to two pound fish to the market as fast as possible. So some of these general statements we can make, but then we'll also talk about how they relate to your specific need for the fish. Carbohydrates, so I mentioned already, it's um, the, the smaller portion of what's in the diet, and there's a different, they're a very diverse group of molecules. They include starches, um, sugars, but they basically help to glue everything. And there are certain species that have very low tolerance levels for high carbohydrates or high sugars, and we might call them, I always refer to them as like the little diabetic fish. It just can't take it. It can't take quite so much. So again, all of these things are very important for the understanding of formulating the feed for the right species. The extrusion process um, creates the gelatinization of these starches. And what that does is it allows for the pellet to expand and for, for the face to add the oil back on top. Because you might have remembered through that flow chart we do some of that top coating at the end, and that's where the majority of your oil is being put onto the pellet. It definitely improves the binding, and so it reduces the, the dust, the breakage, and um, it just it creates a much more durable pellet. And it actually improves digestibility tremendously. So go back to the very first slide. If you're throwing parts and pieces of animals into the pond, and how efficient is that? Maybe the fish is eating a little bit of it, some of it sinks to the bottom, some of it gets eaten, but um, it's really hard to basically gauge when a fish may be being overfed on parts and pieces. Think about the difference of how easy it is now to actually deliver what you want in a pellet to the fish. You still overfeed, for sure, but it definitely improves the overall digestibility and how much energy and all of those good things that in the pellet get to the fish itself. So, and then the very last part is just, as I said, less than 1%. Vitamins and minerals and pigments, other additives that may be added into your diet. It's pretty essential though, because there are some of these that are in very small portions related to the entire pellet but they really play a key role. And thinking of how you might have the, the missing link in the chain, and that's a little misspell there, but, um, you know, when you have that missing link in the chain, it doesn't matter how long the chain is or how strong everything is, but if you've got that one missing link in the middle, it's not going to pull anything. So the vitamins and minerals are very essential when it comes down to making sure, even though it's a really small amount, it's absolutely essential for the proper nutrition. And this is just a slide at the end to show a few of the things that we had talked about in their raw material form. How much of it do you add? I mean, do you just add as much as you want? I mean, come on, you know, it's like, what's the recipe? How is there something that I go to to look? And there is. Um, the Nutritional Requirements of Fish and Shrimp, which is the National Research Council. Um, this is a huge book, and I would say that I go to a lot of fish farms and I see it. I go to a lot of fish farms and I don't. But it's an interesting book to maybe take a look at investing if you're really curious a little bit more about fish nutrition um, because it does show the requirements of what we do know. And I will say we as a nutritional group of people all over the world that does research, all of this data is getting compiled, not just spreading. These are all over the world researchers that have done massive amounts of of research and information to find out what does it take, how much protein does a salmon need. Now, what I will say is it's spreading uh, the company I work for goes a bit above and beyond, and we also have what we call our AQTM, our quality measures. And many of the requirements that are put into the fish feed for a spreading brand is slightly above what the nutritional requirements are because it's the basis. The nutritional requirements of NRC are the basics of what the fish will need. We talked about how much would a salmon need, but this is a really good example to kind of show you how much protein, let's just go back to protein because it is the biggest component of your diet, how much protein do salmon need? And why would we choose to buy a diet that was 
40% protein versus a diet that might be 48% protein, something on the range of those two ends. And the reason that I really like to show this slide is because there are different ways to look at feed formulation. And if you look at the active on the bottom, the fish size or pellet size, so this is a small fish getting to a larger fish, and the digestible protein is measured on the axis, and it's showing you this graph with a blue straight line with an arrow pointed to it that says there is straight line all the way across. That means in the entire phase of the fish's life, it's always being fed exactly the same amount. Well, that really isn't the optimal way to feed a fish. At certain periods of time, you may have excessive amounts of protein as the fish get older, in which your price is not efficient for what you're paying for. And if you look on the other end of that blue line towards your left, you'll see that in the earlier stages, maybe you're not getting enough protein. And so you would, you would maybe take a look at a reduced growth potential and have a higher feed conversion. But when I talk about what should we do with how to formulate as the fish gets older, if you really look at that red line, and that red line is showing the digestible protein requirement of the fish. So for protein, it's very high at the beginning of the fish's life, but as it is growing, it decreases. So the two take home messages here in this one slide is that you can either buy a feed that formulates the digestible protein requirement and follow that red line, but it does take additional management strategies, I will say, or you can buy feed that we refer to as maybe a standard feed, where the feed formulation is the same protein and fat all the way throughout the fish's life. So again, two different concepts and what your purpose is. Both of these may work well. One may work better than the other, and there's reasons behind all of it. So I promise this is the last most complicated slide that we'll take a look at, and this is the last take-home message. So if you just shut down after this slide, you would be fine. <laughs> Hopefully you won't. But um, to me, this slide is probably one of the slides that I put into almost every presentation. And it looks pretty crazy at the beginning. Let's just take a look at it from what we just learned. The title is that there's a strong effect of digestible energy on fish performance. And so we've got an X, Y, and Z axis, and where we're looking at the specific growth rate along the left side, along the bottom, the digestible energy, remember that term I kept using, and then the conversion is all the way out over here on our Z axis. So if you take a look at the digestible energy at 16, and as it increases to 19, I want you to follow the line that is the specific growth rate, and that's going to be the diagonal red, red diamond there. And that is going to show you that as the fish gets more energy, the specific growth rate, how much it goes per day, is actually going to increase. That's important. So if the specific growth rate is increasing, what do we think is happening to the feed conversion rate? If this model holds true, which it does, the feed conversion in the blue squares is going to decrease with the increasing amount of digestible energy. So that's really that take-home message kind of explained in a different way on a graph with some numbers so you can see. And at the bottom, those two parts there that have the, the bullets, it says the SDR is reduced on average of about 0 0.05 units per megajoules of digestible energy. Lots of words there. What that basically means is that we can take that number, 0 0.05 units, and we can use that in a calculation to determine if I should be buying a 40% protein diet or if I should be buying a 45% protein diet. And we can use those numbers to create a model that should show you, well, once I put the price in, then I can hopefully determine whether it's more efficient for me as the farmer to buy a more expensive feed or maybe not so much an expensive feed. Same concept for the specific growth rate. As the specific growth rate increases, 
about 3.6% per megajoules of digestible energy. So same concept, we're going to use that number to find out how fast are my fish going to grow if I change from a 40% protein to a 45% protein. And those numbers at the end, megajoules per digestible energy, what in the heck is that? We'll take a look at that, and what you will see is something called a product sheet. And that digestible energy is that number I kept talking about that we need to know what is the total energy in the diet that is digestible. And that's the number that's really important. You won't find it on a feed label. You're going to have to call the feed company or get a product sheet. In the case of scraping, we provide those. And look at those numbers so that we can do some math and we can actually have a really good discussion about what's the best feed for my location. And this is the part in which I just discussed everything we talked about, and I tried to put it into a slide that showed a more practical application. The product, there's a different cost, and the cost is related to your performance. And as I mentioned earlier, a lower energy oil diet could go as low as 12 and maybe as high as 32%. So what am I supposed to buy as a farmer? And if I'm using one, what is the benefit for me to switch to another? So using that as kind of a, a different visual to see that there are many different ranges of energy levels in diet. And the purpose of hopefully what I do for the company I work with is to really help the farmer understand what's the best option for their particular location. Now we get to some common feed questions, of which I would usually open the floor and ask you guys, what are your questions? But I'm going to throw a few in that I always get so that we can, then you'll have your opportunity to ask. But the three main problems with feed as it gets old, because I always get the question, can I feed expired feed? I mean, that's probably at the top of my list as far as one of the number one questions. And I'll say that there are three main problems with feeding fish that is outside of its expiration date, one of which could be vitamin degradation. What that means is hard to see it, you can't really smell it, but over time, the vitamins that are in the fish feed will degrade. And that happens based on many different factors, heat, oxygen, moisture, if your feed is being exposed to UV light, and clearly the age of the feed. So the feed company I work with, um, we have a 12-month shelf life for feed, except if it has astaxanthin in it, which does degrade faster in a diet, and so it has a six-month shelf life. Now, the one that's pretty easy to see is mold, and Basically, that comes from moisture and heat together. It just creates mold. We're all pretty familiar with mold. Um, it doesn't work so well for fish. And it can start with initial small amounts of mold that um, maybe not so toxic in the beginning, but as it sits in the bag, it's going to create um, just a nice environment for the rest of the bag to get really toxic. Um, in Hawaii, this is a big problem because we store our feed not in refrigerated containers as maybe one should, but when it's hot, moist, and damp all the time around the ocean, uh, you can imagine that you may have some instances where you run into moldy feed. But, you know, it's, it's just a no-brainer to me. Do not feed moldy feed. So that's my answer, no. <laughs> um, rancidity, you can smell it, and it's pretty pretty obvious. Um, rancidity can also um, come from poor storage, and um, if the feed is a high oil content feed, you might imagine it would be more susceptible to rancidity stored in poor condition. So it does, yeah, it just smells like it says, you know, turpentine or paint. It's, it's pretty obvious. Do not feed it. It will definitely kill the fish. So that brings me to what's the best way to store feed. Uh, we've already covered the shelf life, but the most important is cool and dry. Um, if it's a consistent environment, that's really helpful. 
because having a facility where you come in and out of all the time and the temperatures are changing drastically, that can create a perfect scenario for moisture to build and mold to start. Needs to be a well ventilated area and keep the rodents out as best you can. Um, I know that that's the best part of <laughs> having a feed room is trying to figure out how am I supposed to keep all the things that want to eat it out of it. And there's lots of ways. And remember that you're spending about 50 to 60 percent of your feed operation on feed. So I always suggest to really invest into a proper feed storage. One of the most important things that sounds pretty simple, but it isn't, I go to a lot of farms that are not doing first in, first out. And that's, um, that's very essential because you want to be feeding the oldest feed first. And um, when we talk about ordering feed and how quickly do you rotate through feed and your feed storage bins, I go through all of that with farmers as well to find out the best way and how frequently should we be ordering feed. So um, storing it, well, we've, we've, we've made it, we've stored it, now we need to really just get to it, right? I mean, this is the big, this is the big thing, just feed the fish. But feed management, as I said, um, is, is a massive book, you know, and we always are learning about feed management. But I would also like to say that feed management is your very first line of defense when it comes to understanding how are your fish. And as managing farms, I work in small hatchery, uh, work with small fish in hatchery. And it works with really big fish in tanks and massive cages offshore. And one of the first things that I would always ask the person who came back and seemed to feed really quickly, how did the fish look? Oh, they look fine. I mean, how many times do you hear that, right, from, from someone that's working on your staff? How many times did you actually go and feed the fish and observe the fish eating or observe the fish's behavior? take the time to do so. It's, it's a really, really huge component. It's the biggest component, honestly, of what the farms do is feed their fish. And typically, we put the lowest paid person that has the least experience in what I would consider to be one of the most important jobs. So I'm not saying to pay them off the records and charts or something, but what I am saying is that if we train are new people as they come in to look at the feed label. What are you feeding? What is the protein in fact? Is it the right food for the species? I go to a lot of farms that actually have more than one species on the farm. And if nobody's paying attention, they may be feeding a catfish feed to the surgeon. Well, that is not going to work. Um, we need to track feed and the fish performance daily. Um, I understand a lot of small farms, they say this is impossible, Jackie. What do we do? What's the best thing to do? How, how do you get the best information with the least amount of time? And all of those things are questions that as a farm manager, I think it's really something you have to look at yourself. Many small farms have the same person doing every job on the farm. And is there anybody ever overseeing or just looking at those numbers as well just to double check? So feed conversion ratio, we're going to review what that is. It's the amount of fish food in to how much feed, excuse me, how much in product or fish you're going to get out. And that specific growth rate we keep talking about is what is the rate in which the fish grow. But I would also say one of the most important things when I go to a farm and they'll say, Jackie, the fish are not eating. It's the feed. It's whatever. I mean, it, it could be a million things. I'll ask for their historical feed data. When did you notice the fish stopped eating? When did you notice that the fish changed with their intake, the total amount? What were the fish observations? And surprising, I don't usually get to look at a lot of that because people think that it's not that important to write it down. Even small farms, I'm not necessarily advocating to make five people necessary for your small farm, but think about the time that it takes to write down a few important components. 
And that's going to really, really save you in the long run when you come up against some problems. I've already mentioned it's about 60, 50 to 60 percent of your overall cost. So how effective you are at feeding pays off. And how much energy is in the feed also actually can affect that production cost. And that was one of those comments I made when we were talking about digestible energy and those numbers. That is very important to understand. If I'm going to buy that higher energy feed, it really does need to pay off. And then again, I mentioned there were some uh, appendices in which we're going to take a look at the tools for our uses, things that we can use to be efficient. So let's look at the feed label. Um, what does it tell us? It tells us the name of the product. It has a product code. If it's, for example, coming from Scredding, it has a lot number. It has a manufacturing date. It should have an expiration date. And it should have a list of raw materials in the order of inclusion. That is what is required on every feed label that you receive by law. So look at it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it is surprising at how many people will open a bag of feed and never look at the feed label. Um, we need to make sure that we are getting what we pay for. Did you get the right product? Um, but more importantly, you know, these best before days, expiration, et cetera, et cetera, that's that first in, first out. So wherever you're receiving your feed from, if there is something on that feed label that you do not understand, please pick up the phone and call the feed company and ask them to explain it to you. And if I would say the last take-home message, I said the last one was, but this is a simple one, go back to your farm and look at the feed label. And find out how much fat and protein you're feeding your fish. For example, this one is a crude protein of 44%. You'll see the words minimum next to it and the crude fat at 20%. You'll see the words minimum next to that as well. And a list of the ingredients. So go back and look at your feed label. This is the simplest way to talk about feed conversion ratio. There is maybe fish feed, and let's just use the example of 100 pounds of fish feed. And once you're finished feeding and you harvest, you've got 100 pounds of fish weight. Well, that's outstanding because that's a one-to-one -one fish conversion ratio. And basically, that number, the higher the other side on the right gets, the worse off you are on your farm because it's taking more fish feed to actually get you what you're looking for on the other end. Here's just a few examples. And for those of you that think feed conversion ratio is something I know, don't have to worry about it, then skip this part. For those that don't, it's a very basic um, weight of the feed that is being fed, which is why we should really write down how much you're feeding divided by the fish weight gain. And so if you fed 100 pounds, we just saw this example, your fish, um, the fish weight gain equal to 100 pounds, you're at a 1.0 feed conversion. If you feed 100 pounds and the fish weight gain equals 110 pounds, wow, that's probably something more like the fish that's in the hatchery because that, um, that smaller fish is metabolism is really, really going very quickly, and the fish are growing very fast. As you get older, the fish get older, that number goes in the other direction. So maybe it becomes a 1.2 or a 1.3. Those are the numbers that you really should be watching to see how that number affects your budget. So this is an example. I'm not going to read through the whole thing because Jim is going to provide you with the presentation. But let's just say you have a farm that raises 400,000 pounds. There's your average price of your fish feed. If you have an average run that has a feed conversion of 1.4, and you have another run that the feed conversion is a 1.1, wow, look at the difference in the price and what you would be saving in order to make sure you are feeding efficiently to get that 1.1 feed conversion because that's about $90,000 when it comes to a pretty large farm. 
do the numbers for your farm. Basically, the take-home message here is know what your feed conversion ratio is, and in order for you to determine whether you should change feed maybe to a higher energy or not, we're going to need this information in order to get to the next step. The next step says we need to know the energy level in the diet. We've already mentioned that. And that energy level drives how much you're feeding. So if you purchased a 40% protein diet and you did switch over to a 45% protein diet, do you think you'd feed more or less of the 45% diet? Overall, you're going to probably feed less of the higher energy diet because those fish are be going to become satiated because it's more bang for the buck, I guess you could say. Feeding it popcorn or am I going to feed it um, maybe like a peanut butter cracker, you know, something a little bit more dense. So is it more cost effective to feed that lower energy diet or do you feed less of a higher energy diet? And as I mentioned, those are some numbers that can effectively compare two different diets, three different diets. But what we need is this number. And this is just an example of what the company I work with provides as a product sheet. And that key number is on the far right-hand side of digestible energy, megajoules per kilogram. And I just put it off to the side as 16.7. And then if you look at the higher energy diet below, the average is 17.8. That's the highest energy level in that pellet size because you may note that there are different energy levels with every different pellet size and that's really important to understand as well. But for the purpose of what we're looking at, these are the two numbers, 16.7 megajoules, 17.8 megajoules per kilogram that we would look at and put some math and put some formulation to, like we just said, to determine whether or not we're getting the most bang for the buck when we are feeding the fish. So to summarize the importance of efficient feeding, I think you all as farmers, you know, you know this, uh, but do we practice it? And I really think that's part of the take home that when you go back and what have we learned is am I really applying some of these basic things that I do know? Am I really doing it? Is are you you know, are you feeding efficiently? because it does provide the greatest growth potential and the lowest feed conversion. And that means you've got to track the numbers in order to track yourself. So take that time to do so. Overfeeding definitely wastes feed and it excessively reduces the water quality very quickly. So I always mention when we talk about switching from one diet to the next, and if there's a different energy level, you better start talking to the feeders on the farm to let them know they should be feeding and noticing if they're having to use less of that higher energy diet. But if you don't tell anybody, I guarantee you they're going to go out there and throw out just about the basic thing that they would usually throw out, right? So always pay attention um, and alert everybody that you're working with so that they're aware of what they're feeding. Underfeeding does the same thing. It just results in a loss of growth. And we all know that we get all those, you know, the little little tiny fish, the big ones, the middle size, and we just get so much size variation. So I think in summary, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, these appendixes um, are basically tools for feeding efficiently. Spreading provides a feeding chart. The company that you are buying your feed from should be able to provide you with a feeding chart. And this is one of the ones that, uh, that I would share with our farmers. And always remember that when you're looking at these feeding charts, the most important thing from my perspective is to look at the suggestion of the pellet size to the fish size. And I think Emma had mentioned a few questions that might have come up, and I think this might have been something to discuss, but it's a really good point. And when we talk about a diet that is a 40% protein, 12% fat, that we feed pretty much from maybe a 3.5 pellet all the way through to 
if we are using that for a commercial fish for harvest, this is less important. And the reason because is it's always a 4012. So everybody gets the same energy no matter what pellet size. But if you start to really decide to feed based on that digestible energy curve that we talked about, this fish size, pellet size, is going to be very important because every pellet size is a different feed formulation. And so something like this chart where you'd have to look at the feed size and the suggested size of the fish to feed based on that pellet size. I think the biggest component of anything that we share in feeding charts and feeding um, uh, guidelines is that all, all of these are suggestions. You must really adjust these to each of your farm locations, and you'll see that at the bottom of each one. This is a feed calculation spreadsheet. I get a lot of questions. I have just started with 150,000 fish yacking, and they're trout, and I'm going to start them on a number zero starter crumble. And I want to grow them to whatever the size is. Never done this before. How much feed am I supposed to buy and what pellet size is? So this is kind of an example of what you might want to look at in order to do a calculation for yourself for maybe a, a, as you're stocking in whatever species it is, what are the feed sizes? What size are you going to start that fish on? What pellet? When do you stop it? And then you can see that there's the gain in kilograms. You've got a feed conversion. And then this is going to be how much feed is needed. So overall, if we use those numbers that we talked about, something like deciding how much feed I should order becomes a pretty simple task to put into a spreadsheet. And that way, you at least have some guidelines and you're not just ordering way too much feed or not enough feed and you get into a situation where, whoops, I just ran out. <laughs> so in summary, thanks for listening as you didn't really have a choice <laughs> because it was all straight through. Uh, appreciate your attention. And again, if you have any questions relative to things I haven't covered, I'm happy to address those. Emma will have my contact information, and very um, good luck and good fortune in all your fish endeavors. Thanks.